Does the amount of hours that you study every single day directly impact the results that you'll get at the end of the year when your, all your exams are done? Probably. However, speaking to a lot of high achieving students, what I tend to see for those scoring in the top, you know, 5% of students is that they're studying anywhere from one to eight hours plus a day. And so that poses the question, you know, what is the perfect amount of time that you should be studying in a day for you so that you can achieve the grades that you want to get into your dream career. And so we're gonna be answering that question in this video. Hey guys, Archer here, a second year medical student. And on this channel, we learn how to learn so we can spend more time with the things and people that matter the most to us. Today, we're gonna to be answering the age old question, how many hours should I be studying a day? And this has just been asked so many times on this channel, in my DMs, you know, on the street even, it's just a question that we all have. I remember when I was even asking this question myself when I was in year 11 and 12, and now after a few years of thinking about this and experimenting, I think I finally have the answer. However, like most things in life, there is not one size that fits all. It's gonna really depend on what type of person you are, how you learn, all these sort of factors that are unique to you. And so the amount of time that you need will also be unique, but we're gonna figure out how to get that actual number for you. So let's get into it. The first thing that we're gonna look at is you know, the correlation between learning and how important that is in answering the question at hand. So then we'll look at the simple answer to this question and then how you can go about actually about finding the right answer for you. And along the way, I'm gonna be dropping tangible study techniques throughout this video that's gonna help you out even more. Timestamps are on the screen now, so feel free to jump through wherever you'd like. The main thing to establish from the start is that there's a pretty strong correlation with how much you need to study with your competency of how you learn at the moment, how good you are at learning. Obviously there are many different layers and levels to what learning really means. So the definition that we're gonna go for here is if you have learned something, it means that you're able to retain it for a very long amount of time and you're able to apply it in unfamiliar and unknown scenarios at a very well capacity as well. So just how there's a relationship between the competency at your ability to learn and how much you need to study, this is also, you know, correlational to the study techniques that you're using. I mean, the quality of those and how much that produces units of learning. So to get better at learning and to reduce the amount of time that we need to study for the certain grades that we want, we have to take a step back and actually assess the study techniques that we're using and the real efficacy of them. Lucky for you, this whole YouTube channel is about this and decoding this, so you're in the right place at the right time. So to do this, we're gonna need some data for a few things. The first one being, how long can you focus for in one sitting? How much time you actually need to learn one whole new topic of information? And again, this can vary. Can you still remember it after a week of learning and how strong that retention actually is? And how long is it taking you to do other tasks that are relevant um, to being a, a better student. So this may be like time management, um, getting onto something and not procrastinating anymore, these sorts of things. So you need to start trying to figure out your answer to these sort of data points. And there's a lot more that you can be calculating depending on your scenario. But the first step is becoming extremely self-aware about where you are at the moment even with all the cognitive biases that we have. So if you're very strong and proficient at studying at the moment, it may feel like that with the current things that you know, but you have to be open as well that there's a lot more out there that could potentially take you to the next level. And if you're someone who's not so confident with your studying, then that's a good thing to notice now because it means that there's an opportunity for you to improve if you start looking in the right area. Tracking everything and how long it takes is a really great way of doing this. I mostly do this on an app called Amazing Marvin and I do this as much as I can until there's certain days where I'm just so packed that I can't even track this. Uh, you might liken this to some people who track their calories, right? You want to do this as well with your task because we're going to be focusing a lot on how our energy changes and how efficient we actually are. And you'll see how a lot of time can be misused um, or could be used better. Now, if you don't have Amazing Marvin yet, um, there is a referral code that I have that gives you an extended 30 day trial on top of what you already get. So you can get 60 days for free. And after that, it's really cheap anyway. So you might as well. But um, if, you want, if you're not up for this yet, then you can just use like a stopwatch and then record this in Notion or in like Apple Notes or something like that. Now the simple answer to this age old question, how much do you need to study every day? It just completely depends on how good you are, how efficient, how effective your study techniques are at producing learning, right? So we can spend tens of hours studying, but if this is not producing learning, it was all wasted anyway. So studying is the action that we try and do to produce the outcome 
of learning. Now, before moving on, I wanna talk about some myths that hold students back, including high achievers. And the first one is that the amount of hours that you're studying is definitely not a one-to-one -one ratio, a direct relationship with the amount of hours of learning that you've got out of it. So if you're studying six hours a day, that does not necessarily mean that you are learning for six hours. And we know this, we have procrastination and these sort of things. But actually from what I've seen working with a lot of students, collecting data of my own, but also you know looking at the research, the study efficiency of people around our age is actually on average around 30%. And for high achievers, it doesn't even go that far beyond. Uh, we're also looking, you know, underneath 50% of our learning capacity. And this makes sense, especially with university being far more challenging than things in year 11 and year 12. So this probably means that you're only getting around two to three hours of efficient learning if you're studying for six hours. So if we can reduce and get rid of all of this extraneous time that is not being used as productively as possible, we can make sure that studying is producing learning much more. This is super important because you may have a threshold of how much learning you need to actually get done. And then knowing how efficient you are, you're able to you know, estimate how much hours you actually need of studying to produce that much learning. For example, for a particular subject, it may take a really proficient learner uh, maybe one hour to study it and someone who's not so proficient may need to study for six hours and someone who's average may study for three hours. This is something that's gonna be unique to you. This leads nicely onto the second biggest myth that there is around this sort of space is that when you feel good about how much studying you've done, that is a reliable predictor of how much learning has occurred and how well you go in your test. Literally, you know these people that I'm talking about, they'll tell you that they've studied for 10 hours, they study for 12 hours a day, and they're so proud of this that it becomes essentially their identity, their personality, and they still don't do that great on the test. So we should feel really proud about being able to study less, but still get good grades, instead of the opposite. And this is really what I see a lot of, is just like people are so proud about how much they're studying because it's showing how committed they are to their grades and their studies and all this, but it isn't what actually produces the actual results. So let's think about this logically. If you are able to get an A plus in two hours, would you prefer to do that over studying for four hours and getting the same grade? Of course, you're gonna to wanna to do it for two hours, but as much as I say this, there are gonna be students out there who will completely ignore this. They don't feel um, that they're prepared to do something like this and make changes for this. They'll wait for a perfect time later on to make this happen. It's never gonna cut, it's never gonna come, uh, in fact, because things will always keep getting more busy and more busy. So regardless of all of these warning signs that it's so important to focus on this, there are still people who watches th who will watch this video who will just ignore it. The majority of your ability to learn is completely within your control and how you spend all of your time studying. And that's literally the clear mission statement of this whole channel, which is why you know I'm, I, I love study techniques a lot. I actually even have a whole video that explains my study techniques and how they've changed over time. I just realized that this was off, so I just put it back on. <laughs> Now we're moving on to a very important topic regarding this, which is your ability to focus and how long you can keep this up within a session. The basic idea is that we will only want to be working when we're completely focused solely on a task so we can use as much of our brain resources to focus on this and that speeds up the efficiency. So, you know, as I mentioned all the time on this channel, you know, cognitive switching penalty is a real thing where if you have lots of things that keep grabbing your attention, that's gonna make it harder to get back onto the uh, task that you're meant to be focusing at hand. And there's also this thing, you know, sort of called like residue where, you know, you keep thinking about that other task that you were just reminded about as you're trying to focus on that one thing. So, you know, it adds this thing called extraneous load, which just makes it harder for us to focus. And when we're collecting the data, like we've already spoken about, we can start to even create our own energy map and figure out where our energy spikes and where it dips the most. This means that you can even allocate your tasks accordingly. So you're not, you know, for example, I don't record these YouTube videos you know, around like three to 5 p.m. because I'm always in a slump during that time. This is the popular reason that study techniques like Pomodoro can be ineffective in some cases where for example, you know, your focus doesn't completely align with the 20 minute timer. And even if you, you know, you have your own time, like 40 minutes, you're not always gonna have 40 minutes of focus productivity. Sometimes you're gonna be only able to focus for like 10 minutes. This is why things like Flamedoro are so powerful if you're able to have the discipline to use something like this. 
So I have a video on that if you want to check that out. So you can think about Flomodoro as a shoe that comes in many, many, many different sizes so it can fit the individual. Whereas the Pomodoro only has a few selections of sizes. And so that means it's quite limited in you know, the cases it can be used. Using the Flow Medora will not mean you're only more efficient in your specific study sessions, but we're collecting more data here about how many cycles is best for you before you become worn out. You'll figure out when are the best times for you in the day, and also you know, your peak focus, how long that can really last. Equipped with this information, you can start to take your scheduling to a completely different level. Now taking in consideration your energy map, where your energy spikes and decreases. So in theory, this means that you can spend less time on studying if you're scheduling around this. Another thing that we should consider here is that a lot of people take study quite aimlessly, like, okay, I'll just get some methods done. We wanna have a clear idea and a clear intention of what we expect we should be able to get done within one hour of focus productivity. When we set these smart goals in place, we can actually assess if we're able to hit these. This allows us not only to be more efficient because we're setting a goal for ourselves, but we're gonna be able to collect more data yet again. So in order to do this, we can do two things. The first one being intention setting. This is what I just mentioned then, setting your smart goals, giving yourself a direction, and you'll know how to allocate your time within this one hour. The other thing is reverse goal setting. And this is extremely important. And it's part of the reason that we can become, you know, quite demotivated at times and procrastinate on things because we don't understand practically the sheer importance of missing out on that one day of going to the gym or for example when we just don't do this study session we lose sight of these things and our brain is really not quite good at delayed gratification because we always are just primed for you know those quick dopamine hits and so it's very hard for us to assess you know the importance of things long term so what is reverse goal setting it's basically what it sounds like you have the goal in mind and then you need to keep taking steps backwards to figure out what you need to achieve in order to get that goal so why reverse goal setting because thinking about the outcome itself is is not really gonna change much things. It's all about the processes that you are building in order to get to that point. And this is because outcomes are a mere symptom of following a certain process. So reverse goal settings allows us to split these outcome-based goals into smaller performance-based goals. This allows you to focus on the process of learning instead of just being fixated on the results. And I talk about this a lot. We wanna be really enjoying the process and not just waiting and enjoying the outcome because it can usually be quite far away. And also, you know, there's other factors that are in play about outcomes. We can't really control that, but we can control the processes and the journey up until that point. Now, let me show an example. Let's say your goal was to get 100% on your end of year exams. If you were traditionally setting your goals, you'd be setting that and that would be pretty much it. However, the main problem is that there's a huge gap between where you are right now and being that sort of person who's able to get 100% in all their exams. And it can be unclear by this point to see what are the things that you specifically should be focusing on most to be able to get that sort of result. So basically there's these two points here, we need to figure out everything that happens between the finish and the start point. Instead of just saying like, okay, so for example, like uh, if I want 100%, well then that probably means that I need to get better at studying. Well, I mean, where does that fit in this sort of process here? Are you gonna focus on that now or later down the process? So reverse goal setting allows us just to work backwards and that makes it very linear and quite systematic. So if you're kind of doing this process, this is the thing that you might see. This is just a basic example to show you the idea, but this can become far more effective if you're using even smaller performance goals and as well, beginning to use, you know, Cobb's experiential cycle along with the law of marginal gains, which is gonna be massive in this as well. So this lays out that very clear path to where you are right now, to the ultimate person that you wanna become. Using this path and seeing where you are right now, you can figure out with the time that you have left before getting that sort of outcome, what are the goals that you need to be hitting and when. So these smaller performance goals, when do you need to be hitting these? And then, then, you, need, then you can ultimately figure out how much should you be studying each day when you have this all planned out. If you're that sort of person who really wants a concrete number, that is the extent that you need to go to figure that out to a reasonable degree. And remember, there are levels of uncertainty. So we wanna make sure that we're studying a little bit more than we need to when we can. During this whole process, you need to be collecting data 
and keeping track of how long it's taking you to get to this certain point. And did you overshoot that? And we always overshoot how long something's gonna take. So we should take that into account as well. So to break this down as much as possible, if we're able to figure out how much we're gonna need to improve and how long we think each step is gonna take with how much time we have, we can start to divide that time up into hitting these performance goals and that will allow you to figure out how much you need to study every day. And if you wanna get really good at saving your time and studying more efficiently, where you know one hour of effective study is gonna save you 10 hours of studying later on, make sure to check out my video on how to pre-study. It's a perfect place to begin and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.